Welcome to Behind the Schemes, a discussion of how commerce, corruption, and counterfeit cures are destroying our planet's precious wildlife. This is Risha Kota Larsen with Behind the Schemes, and in this episode, we're talking about laundering wildlife in Southeast Asia. Today, Southeast Asia's unique wildlife is making its way to nearly every corner of the world as exotic pets, folk medicines, and even short-lived curiosities. Many of these species are found only in Southeast Asia, and the region is quite literally being emptied of its wildlife. Although some of this trade is legal, a significant portion of it is not. Chris Shepard, Deputy Regional Director of Traffic Southeast Asia, gives us an in-depth look at how the region's wildlife is being laundered with trade loopholes and smuggled to markets all over the world. A very disturbing story recently unfolded in Thailand involving wildlife breeders who were essentially laundering tigers and other animals for illegal trade. Can you tell us what was going on here? But this isn't a, an uncommon mo mode of uh, smuggling in the region where people are claiming to be breeding animals um, and either exporting them with paperwork saying that they're from a legal source and, and legally mm -hmm. kept a bread or, or have facilities that are, are, are not allowed to trade um, like a zoo or something that's not, not permitted to engage in international commercial trade of, of particular species. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, of course, there's, a, there's actual uh, collections, wildlife collections, with illegally sourced animals that, that aren't even permitted to operate. So any number of these um, scenarios could have, could have been behind that. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the list of animals in this instance, and I noticed tigers and, and other big cats. What would be the significance of having those types of animals in, in this type of operation? Well, big cats are in in high demand in, in international trade, either live for zoos or collections, or for bones and meat, which are traded uh, largely to Eastern Asia, mm -hmm. use in traditional medicines or, or for consumption. Mm -hmm. So, very likely, this was uh, a commercial operation to supply one of those demands. And so they would be using paperwork and laundering these animals then. Is, is that how that works? That's, that's actually a very common mode of smuggling wildlife in the region, using paperwork that's either, either false paperwork or uh, government-issued paperwork that's been um, altered or falsified, claiming the animals to be from a legal source or claiming wild-caught animals to be captive bred. How much do you, of the illegal wildlife trade would you estimate is taking place under the cover of, of legal trade? You said it was fairly common. This is a, a very big problem in the region. It's widespread. It's happening all the time. It involves a huge number of species and, and um, huge quantities as well. How, how many animals are, are involved? That's hard to say. How many people even is hard to say. Hmm. But it is an issue that we're working on a lot. Um, Captive breeding of reptiles, for example, that we're constantly coming up against cases where reptiles are taken from the wild, declared as captive bred and exported by a legitimate exporter, with paperwork saying that the animals are, are captive bred, but in fact they're wild. This is this is very common in Southeast Asia, with markets in, in Europe, in, in the United States, in Japan, in Hong Kong, and it's very difficult for the for the enforcement agencies in the importing countries to. To, to do anything about it. it. It's very hard for them to tell whether or not the animals are captive bred or wild caught. The dealers know that this is the, the challenge the enforcement agencies face, so they, they take advantage of this. Hmm. Um, we, we, we're we seeing the same thing with birds, birds coming out of um, so-called captive breeding places all over the, all over the world, um, exporting huge quantities of birds, declared as captive bred when in fact they're, they're from the wild. So some of these you can just do simple math and, and 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 prove some of it is is false. Just just looking at the breeding biology of a species. If, if an animal only lays a couple of eggs a year, um, and yet the exporter is exporting them by the hundred or by the thousands, uh, it, it, you you can you can prove to some extent that what they're doing is false. But others, it's much more challenging. Hmm. 
But a lot of the, the species from Southeast Asia, for example, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of the Chinese soft shell, mm -hmm. just, just, don't, just don't breed in, in those volumes. It's, it's just not feasible to set up a business to, to have to breed a lot of these species. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's bad business. You'll just lose money. Some of them don't mature. Uh, they don't sexually mature until they're 8 or 10 years old, and then they only lay a few eggs a year. Mm -hmm. And then that, the hatchlings only retail for $10 on the market. So um, if, if you did the math and looked at it purely from a business point of view, it's, it's bad business. You'd lose money. Um, where, you, where they do make a profit is when they successfully launder wild-caught animals as being kept to bread and get away with it. Uh, and they usually do get away with it. Mm -hmm. And this is the case, you said there's species of birds also that just lay a couple of eggs every once in a while, and this is the same, this is the same type of thing then? Yeah, sure. Um, different species of cockatoos, of, of uh, raptors, uh, different kinds of parrots. Some of the breeders are breeding a few, mm -hmm. but just not in the volumes that we're seeing in, in trade. Hmm. With um, these types of animals, the reptiles and birds, are these mostly for exotic pet trade? The large majority of the species exported by breeders uh -huh. are, for the, are for the pet trade, uh -huh. usually to Europe, to the United States, mm -hmm. uh, Japan. Uh, these are usually for the pet trade. You see a lot of, a lot of animals, um, like sugar gliders, they're a small gliding possum, mm -hmm. being exported from Indonesia by the thousands um, hmm. as kept bred. The market value is just too low to make breeding of these um, worthwhile on that scale. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, the different monitor lizards and different snakes from eastern Indonesia that are being exported as captive bred um, by, the, by the hundreds, sometimes by the thousands. And yet, leading zoos around the world that have been trying to breed them have, have very few successes. Well, that's very suspicious then, isn't it? Very suspicious. <laughs> oh, man. Now, a different kind of laundering um, is these uh, hunts in South Africa. This is the rhino horns, where they're doing a different kind of laundering. Is that correct? Yeah, similar similar situation. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, taking advantage of, of loopholes or, or abusing abusing legislation uh, for, for profit. This is where, in certain circumstances, rhinos can be obtained legally. Uh, for trophies, mm -hmm. and yet the horns are often being brought back to to Asia, especially to Vietnam, mm -hmm. and and are not kept as trophies. They're they're sold for traditional medicines, which undermines the entire uh, the entire setup that's in place. Right. Hmm. You know, we hear uh, terms like kingpins of the illegal wildlife trade. Do you find that these people are involved with other types of crimes? Yeah, this is a really interesting point. Um, we, we read in the paper and in reports all the time that um, a lot of the dealers are involved in, in numerous other kinds of crimes, drugs especially. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm sure this does happen. There are some mm -hmm. that, some organized crime that just engages in anything that makes money, really. Mm -hmm. um, and, and wildlife trade is a great one because there's so little risk of getting caught and because mm -hmm. penalties. But the vast majority of wildlife dealers that we have um, either worked with or, or um, dealt with in one way or another in this region, in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. aren't, in, aren't involved in, in drug trade or any other trade. They're purely involved in the reptile trade or the bird trade. That's where their expertise lies. Mm -hmm. um, they've got a, a legitimate business, and some of them carry out a legitimate business. Some, some of them use that business as a front mm -hmm. and a large-scale illegal trade, but they're still not involved in other forms of, of crime. And I think the main reason for this is, well, uh, there's a few reasons. A, the profit in wildlife trade is huge, mm -hmm. and the risk is, is very low. Hmm. So that alone uh, and it enables them to make a lot of money. The second thing, the second point really is the penalties for drug trafficking in a number of countries is, is very severe. In many countries in Southeast Asia, it's, mm -hmm. it's the death penalty where the penalty for wildlife trade is usually not much more than a slap on a wrist. Hmm. So, so, you know, when you're making this much money, and, and if, it is, if you are engaged in the drug trade, the police are going to be putting a focus on you. There is hmm. going to be a lot more attention to your business. If it's just wildlife, in most countries, it, it's just not a priority. Mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll continue to get away with, um, with your illegal business, making a lot of money, 
And again, you're, you're not at risk of, of any real serious, serious penalties compared to these other kinds of crime. It's just kind of a business license that they're paying. Yeah, in, in some places, compared to the profit some of these wildlife dealers are making, even if they do get caught, the penalties are so low, it, it's not much more than a tax compared to the hmm. profit they're making. Some countries, uh, Malaysia, for example, has recently greatly improved their legislation. Um, so the, the tools that the enforcement agencies have at hand are, are getting stronger. But we're still not seeing very many people um, caught um, and even fewer of them being convicted. It's just still not a priority. Hmm. And going back, you said that sometimes the wildlife business, um, you said that's a, a, did you say that was a front for another kind of business? Wildlife dealers often have, have a legitimate business, exporting wildlife, breeding wildlife, or exporting wild-caught animals. Um, and this legitimate wildlife business is often used as a, as a front to cover a, a huge um, sort of behind the scenes illegal wildlife business. So they'll have permits to deal in X number of species, but in reality they're dealing in many, many more, including a lot of protected or totally protected species. Oh, okay. So they're laundering then. They're essentially involved in wildlife laundering. They're laundering or just yeah. pure sort of classic smuggling wildlife stuffed okay. in a suitcase and, and smuggled out of the country. Huh. Okay. And then you're talking about these guys having businesses. Um, but we're always hearing uh, that illegal wildlife traders are actually impoverished and that their actions are justified because they're just trying to feed their families. But it doesn't, it doesn't sound like that's accurate. I mean, are we really talking about a, a business enterprise here that's basically being run by criminals? Yeah. We hear this a lot as well, and, and it really is, is quite interesting. It depends where along the trade chain you're looking. Often mm -hmm. at sort of the, the collection end, the people that are out collecting animals that they in turn sell to, a, to different middlemen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, some of these people are, are definitely living below the poverty line mm -hmm. and um, are, are doing it to try to make some extra money. But that's usually what it is, is extra money. Mm -hmm. Most times we've found that the people collecting the animals are employed in, in plantations or farming or other sort of rural or forest work and finding animals that they can sell is a, is a bonus. So, for example, the, the turtle export out of Sumatra, we did quite a bit of work on that mm -hmm. and found many, many, many people are collecting the animals, mm -hmm. but none of, none of them are collecting full-time and none of them relied on that as a full-time income. Huh. A, and when you get up to the middleman level mm -hmm. and then up to the, the retail commercial exporters and importers, mm -hmm. uh, these people are a long way past, the, they're not near the poverty line. Mm -hmm. These people are usually making um, a lot of money and, and poverty and, and um, you know, sort of putting food on the table is no longer an issue. It's more, more like putting another BMW in the garage. Oh my gosh. It's not a, a poverty issue at all anymore. Oh my gosh. Going back to these uh, people that you said may have other work, they might be working in a plantation and then just collecting animals, How do they know what kinds of animals to be looking for to collect, or are they just seeing things and, and grabbing them um, in an opportunistic way? Um, for certain species, agents will visit rural areas or small communities Mm -hmm. and, and, and basically let everyone know if they find freshwater turtles or pangolins or certain species of birds or snakes that have a higher commercial value, that they'll be back to, to, to buy whatever they catch on a regular basis, weekly yeah. or monthly or whatever. Uh. So there's sort of order, but in, in a lot of cases as well, it, it is opportunistic. If you look at the bird trade in Indonesia, for example, if you went to the big bird markets in Jakarta, uh, there are some high-profile um, expensive birds that are, that have been caught um, on order, but there's also a lot of a lot of just random species that are just have been just opportunistically caught and mm -hmm. are just just wound up in the market so somebody can make a buck. Ugh. And uh, when you say on order, who who would order something like this? Do you mean like the agents that you mentioned, or at the uh, the buyer level, like the person who wants this exotic bird in their home? Um, both, but usually okay. it's, it's the, in the case of international trade, usually it's the large scale um, exporters. Oh, okay. They, they know what they have markets for, what, what the demand is. 
Um, they may have orders from retail um, companies in, in the U.S., for example, or in, in Germany or mm -hmm. the Netherlands or wherever. Um, and so they'll put the word out that they need X number of certain number of species. Um, mm -hmm. So it goes both ways. Uh, basically, you can sell whatever you catch, but the high value stuff is a lot, a lot more often. It's it's on order. Huh. So when you say retail, are you saying that there's times when people in the U.S. are walking into, say, a large retail pet store and they're seeing some exotic birds and rap reptiles and there'll be a, a sign in there that, in big letters that says captive bred. Now, are you saying that sometimes they're not captive bred? Is that a possibility? I'm saying very often they're not captive bred. Mm. Um, the retailers, a lot of the big importers, mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, must mm -hmm. know what they're importing it is not wild caught, or is not kept at bread, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but perhaps some of them don't know and are being, are being um, you know, sort of deceived by the, by the exporters. The exporters know. They're the, ones, mm -hmm. they're the ones ordering the wild caught animals and they're exporting. Some of them do breed some mm -hmm. animals uh, in some quantities, and, and some, some, there are some that, that aren't engaged in the laundering at all and are running a completely legitimate mm -hmm. business. The ones that aren't are giving, giving them all a bad name, and they're sort of yeah. getting painted with the same brush. Huh. Um, but a lot of the reptiles, especially the sort of the high-end rare species, mm -hmm. don't breed well in captivity and are, are naturally wild, are, are, sorry, are naturally rare in the wild, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and just, just demand such a high price that, um, yeah, they just overlook all of the breeding and, and the, the policies in place and just export them as, as kept to bread. It's easy to do. They're getting away with it all the time. And it's not just reptiles and birds. There's sugar gliders, there's wallabies, um, a huge number of species that are being taken from the wild and exported as being legitimately bred in captivity. Wallabies? Huh. Yeah, if you go to the markets in places like um, the Chat to Chat market in Bangkok mm -hmm. or the Pramuka market in Jakarta, it's amazing the variety of species you can see. Wallabies, uh, tree kangaroos, cassowaries, different kinds of cockatoos, uh, squirrels, leopard cats, you name it, you can find it. And people are buying these for pets and keeping them in their homes? Yeah, for pets. A lot of them are novelty pets. A lot of them, um, in the past, they've been referred to, and I quite like this expression, as cut flowers. They look nice yeah. in the market. They're, they're cheap. You buy them, you take them home, they look good for a couple of days, uh, and then they die. Oh. Similar to cut flowers. Oh, that's, oh, I, that's very distressing. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> now, going uh, into what happens when these people are caught, um, we love it. Everybody loves it when authorities bust wildlife traders and they're confiscating either live animals or things like rhino horns or ivory pangolin scales whatnot and this is always good news but uh, in, in your opinion how much of the actual illegal trade do you think these seizures represent? Uh, the tip of the iceberg. If the tip that. of the iceberg. Uh, yeah. and, if, uh, and how small would that be do you think? I, I wouldn't want to put a percentage of any kind on it, but it's okay. it's very little, very little. The, the, and and the thing is too that we have to remember is even even though they've made a bust and they've confiscated some rhino horns, that means those rhinos are already dead. Yes. It's got to be a lot more effort put into protecting wildlife while it's still in the wild. Yes. And to put taking the the, the major links of the trade chain, taking them out of putting them out of business, mm -hmm. um, and disrupting these chain, trade chains as much as possible, and then. On top of all that, we, we really have to be focusing on reducing demand. People have to become more responsible in what they buy. Mm -hmm. um, there's alternatives if you're using traditional medicines to rhino horn, for example. You, you, don't need, you don't need an endangered plowshare tortoise or radiated tortoise from Madagascar as a pet. No, you, you, don't. you don't. You don't need an expensive cockatoo that's been smuggled in from Australia to Bali and then on to wherever. Um, people just have to become more responsible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How much of this illegal wildlife trade do you think is going on with 
cooperation of various authorities either actively participating in it or turning a blind eye? How much of that do you think is going on? Well, a lot of the, the, the really sort of large-scale um, dealers that are doing illegal business mm -hmm. couldn't really carry out that kind of business without some sort of cooperation from authorities, either mm -hmm. compliance, um, complacency, I mean, either mm -hmm. complacency, just turning a blind eye, mm -hmm. or active involvement. Mm -hmm. uh, corruption is, is one of the biggest obstacles in conservation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's the same with the, the people that are involved in laundering wild-caught animals as captive bred. The authorities really need to be uh, stepping up their monitoring of these places and putting into place better systems that, that um, make this sort of smuggling more difficult. Um, but if, they, if they're not inspecting the shipments before they leave, if, if the officers don't have the capacity and, and to identify the species, um, if, if shipments are all going out at night, for example, and none of the officers work at night, huh. then, you know, it becomes it all plays into the favor of the exporters, the illegal exporters. Do mm -hmm. you think uh, this is the same regarding ivory, rhino horn, that sort of thing across the board? Do you think that, that there's cooperation going on everywhere with that? I would say it's quite widespread. Okay. Um, and again, though, we have to be careful. There's a lot of enforcement officers out there that are doing their very best to put an end to the illegal trade and, and doing their best at the job. Definitely. But and you get, um, it, yeah, it doesn't take too many rotten apples to ruin yeah. the whole. Oh, very sad. Do you think that uh, public awareness campaigns and increased media reporting can help increase agency transparency and ultimately root out the type of corruption that we're that we're seeing that's ruining everything like you said a few a few bad apples ruining everything definitely um, I, I think one of the big problems is the public isn't aware of what's going on and often doesn't even if they are aware or somewhat aware they don't feel they have any role to play and this is this is another thing that has to change Mm -hmm. Public has a very big role to play. We we should be um, demanding that the the authorities in charge of protecting our wildlife are, are doing their job and doing it well. How can people do that? I think the first step is people have to be uh, educating themselves about mm -hmm. wildlife trade and then educating people around them. Um, knowing what's going on is, is is a big part of the battle. Mm -hmm. People also have to, um, again, as I said, become more responsible in, in what they're, they're, in their consumer behavior, but also asking that of the authorities to, um, the public should be, should be pushing the authorities to shut down businesses that are selling illegal wildlife. You know, mm -hmm. if, if stores are selling bear bile openly, for example, for traditional medicine, then the authorities should be asked to shut those, those places down. Yes. Restaurants selling illegal wild meat. People shouldn't go. They should encourage others not to go. And at the same time, they should be demanding the authorities take action against those places and close them down. Oh, definitely. And going back to uh, authorities, one of the things that I hear people say a lot is CITES needs to do something. But how does that work? Because uh, is it is it really up to CITES to enforce the laws, or is that the responsibility of the member countries? Can you uh, shed some light on that? Enforcing CITES, uh, CITES uh, implementing legislation and national legislation is the responsibility of the enforcement agencies at a national level, the police, hmm. the customs, the wildlife authorities. It's their responsibility. Mm -hmm. CITES is a tool that, that all 175 part, part all 175 countries um, have at their disposal. It's being used in some places and underused in others. Mm -hmm. I think CITES, there's, there's great potential in CITES as mm -hmm. a conservation tool, but like any tool, um, they don't work on their own. Mm -hmm. The tool itself is only as good as, as those that are using it, and in many places it's, it's underused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what it seems like. Many countries have become party to the convention. They are part of CITES, and yet they're they're not uh, fulfilling their obligations. They're not using CITES as an enforcement tool. They're not using CITES to help 
better regulate trade and and strive towards sustainable trade and as a tool to stop illegal trade. Um, and, and this is a real shame. And at the same time, people are blaming this convention for, for being useless and ineffective. Um, I think really it's the authorities that aren't using CITES that the, the focus should be put on. That they should be um, to blame. You, blaming the convention itself yeah, mm -hmm. doesn't make a lot of sense if the parties aren't enforcing it. Interesting. Hmm. Very interesting. So finally, can you tell us more about what Traffic Southeast Asia does and also how people can get involved and help you guys out? Traffic in Southeast Asia uh, monitors a lot of the trade. We, we look at different um, trade, we look at, we examine trade chains and do research on, on how these trade chains work and, and how trade impacts wild populations. And we look at ways that legislation and CITES can be better used and better implemented. Mm -hmm. We look at a number of different issues. Uh, captive breeding of reptiles, for example, is one. Uh, tiger, tiger trade is another. Um, our goal is to ensure that trade isn't a threat to nature. And in Southeast Asia, uh, trade is a, is, a, is a very, very big and very real threat to many species. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Carry out a lot of uh, capacity building for enforcement agencies, uh, developing tools that they can use, such as species identification guides, uh, and, and so on. And, and we train um, wildlife officers, um, police, customs, many other agencies, so that they can hopefully uh, be better equipped to do their job and and have an impact against the, uh, the illegal wildlife trade. Mm -hmm. Great. We, we publish a lot of reports. Uh, all of these are available on our website to, to help, A, raise awareness of what's going on, and also to make recommendations of what steps need to be taken if we're to uh, have an impact. Oh, the reports are great. I use those all the time. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, uh, we, we have a long way to go, though. We're, we're a very small organization, uh, and there's, there's, we're, not, we're not the only one. There's, there's many organizations working to try to stem the illegal wildlife trade and, and reduce the impact of trade. Mm -hmm. um, but we all have a long way to go. It's, it's an uphill battle. Um, wildlife trade volumes seem to be growing every year. More and more species are in trade. The quantities are going up. Um, trade routes are becoming more fluid. And, and it it's really is, um, for many species, we really are seeing a crisis. Where if things don't change soon, we're going to lose a lot more animals, a lot more plants. How can people get involved and help you guys? Uh, as I mentioned, I think people, um, it's sad people think that they don't have a role to play. Everyone has a role to play. Mm -hmm. And first step, as I mentioned, was, was becoming better, better edu educated, learning more about the issues, mm -hmm. and, and telling others about this. This is incredibly important. The media has been, has been great, increasingly useful with more and more stories uh, being carried in the press on um, on wildlife trade and on the impacts of wildlife trade. We're seeing, for example, um, stories about the rhino horn crisis every day. And this is great. People, mm -hmm. people need to know what's going on and then they need to take action. The yes. actions they can take, um, people can become get involved in conservation in a number of ways, financially supporting uh, organizations and projects that are ongoing volunteering in some places, their time to, to assist with different projects. Um, also influencing the government, um, demanding that action is taken against illegal trade. Uh, there's, there's, there's many things that the public needs to be involved in and without the public support, uh, we're not going to get anywhere. That's true. I agree with that. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for spending this time with us today. You're very welcome. Thank you. You've been listening to Laundering Wildlife in Southeast Asia with Chris Shepard, Deputy Regional Director of Traffic Southeast Asia. This is Risha Kota Larson with Behind the Schemes. <laughs>